Today's lecture will continue with legal and ethical issues. Administrative procedures and the law. Risk management. The risk management department is there to follow office policies and procedures, and these will be used as a physician's best defense in court if needed. Paperwork for insurance billing, patient consent forms, and correspondence must be handled correctly to meet legal standards. State reporting requirements must be handled. Items must be reported such as births, certain communicable diseases such as AIDS and STIs, drug abuse, suspected child or elder abuse, violent injuries involving knives or gunshot wounds, and deaths. Meeting legal standards for documentation. Remember, if it is not recorded, then it did not happen. And if it is recorded, then it did happen. Medical staff must pay attention to referrals. Patients must understand if they need to make an appointment or you will do it for them. This must be documented in the chart along with the date and time of appointment if made by the office. Missed appointments. Records should be updated for those patients who no called, no showed, or canceled and not rescheduled. Dismissals. To avoid abandonment charges, a physician must formally withdraw from a case. All letters must be filed in the patient records with confirmation of mailing and then the return receipt. All other patient contact. All records of refills, tests, procedures, telephone conversations, and everything to do with the patient must be documented and initialed, signed, and dated. Medical record correction. Errors in the medical record can be corrected. Do not black out information or use correction fluid or any other way to erase the original wording. Draw a line through the error, write above or below or in the margin, then date and sign the correction. In the electronic medical record, we can delete the word and enter the correct one, and the deleted error will always show up in the record. Ownership of patient record. Medical records are considered to be the property of the medical facility where they were created. However, the patient owns the information they contain. Depending on state law and a signed release, patients may have access to or copies of their records. Under HIPAA, Patient requests must be accommodated with a few exceptions, such as mental health. If a physician feels it would be harmful for the patient to see the records and denies access, the physician is protected under the doctrine of professional discretion. Retention and storage of the patient record. Records should be kept until the applicable statute of limitations period has elapsed, usually seven years. For minors, they may be kept for a specified time after they reach legal age. Credentialing. This is used by various organizations to ensure providers are appropriately qualified to provide services. Physicians must go through Medicare credentialing process in order to bill Medicare for services provided to Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare has three forms for credentialing. Form 855B is used to establish or change a practice group number. Form 855-I is used to establish or re-establish a physician's individual number. And Form 855-R is used to link an individual provider numbers to group practice numbers. The Food and Drug Administration Regulatory Function FDA requires testing on animals prior to human studies or clinical trials. And clinical tests examine the ratio of benefits to the risk of the new patient, new product. Monitoring continues after approval. It applies to over-the-counter and prescription drugs. Legal documents and the patient. Advanced medical directive. Legal document addressed to the patient's family and healthcare providers, stating what treatment the patient would or would not wish to receive should they become unable to verbalize their choice. Some directives contain DNR or do not resuscitate orders. Durable power of attorney. Patients with an advanced medical directive are asked to name in the second document a person who will make decisions for them regarding medical care. This document is the durable power of attorney document. Uniform donor card. Uniform Anatomical Act was passed in 1968, giving all states guidelines to follow in complying with people's wishes to make an organ donation or whole body donation upon their death. 
The Patient Self-Determination Act encourages discussion on end-of-life issues. The advanced directive required of certain facilities for Medicare and Medicaid patients. Federal Legislation Affecting Health Care Health Care Quality Improvement Act of 1986 Federal statute passed to improve the quality of care nationwide. False Claims Act Federal law that allows individuals to bring civil actions on behalf of the U.S. government under a provision of the law called Quay Tam to bring action for the king and oneself. Enacted due to rising health care cost fraud and abuse, such as false billing claims, kickbacks, and self-referrals. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, enacted by Congress to protect individual rights from discrimination based on their genetic information. New genetic testing cannot be required for employment or to obtain insurance coverage. Protected genetic information includes genetic test information of the individual or genetic test information of individual's family members and information about a disease in which an individual's um, family member may have. Insurance carriers and employers cannot use genetic information as basis for denying insurance coverage or employment. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. OSHA is a division of the U.S. Department of Labor, and it creates federal laws to protect healthcare workers from hazards on the job. It controls workers' exposure to infectious disease. It regulates exposure to toxic substances, and Bloodborne Pathogens Protection Standard of 1991 is part of the OSHA Act. If you look on the counter of the lab in your laboratory area, you will see an OSHA safety manual. OSHA requires all medical practitioners follow standard precautions developed by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, known as HIPAA, was passed by Congress in 1996. The primary purpose of HIPAA is to improve efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare delivery through privacy protection to provide access for patients to their own records while controlling inappropriate use of data, to improve the quality of healthcare by restoring trust among patients, healthcare professionals, and other stakeholders committed to patient care. It's divided into two main sections of law, Title I, which addresses healthcare portability, and Title II, which covers the prevention of healthcare fraud and abuse, administrative simplification, and medical liability reform. Title I, Healthcare Portability, increases workers' ability to get insurance when starting a new job, reduces workers' probability of losing existing insurance because of pre-existing condition, helps workers maintain insurance when changing jobs, and helps workers purchase insurance individually if they lose coverage from a group plan, limits use of exclusions for pre-existing conditions, keeps group plans from denying coverage or charging extra based on past, present, poor health of the patient or the patient's family members, guarantees small employers and individuals the right to purchase their own insurance, and employers and individuals can renew insurance regardless of health conditions. Title II is the Prevention of Healthcare Fraud and Abuse, Administrative Simplification, and Medical Liability Reform. The Privacy Rule. Patients' control over health information, sets boundaries on use or release of health data, establishes safeguards for privacy, it holds violators accountable with criminal and civil penalties, and it balances public responsibility with disclosure. Remember every year you have to resign your HIPAA form and you get to decide who gets your information. That's what the privacy rule is all about. Use and disclosure. Use limits the sharing of information within a covered entity. Information is being used when the following is being used. Sharing, employing, applying, utilizing, examining, and analyzing information. Disclosure restricts sharing outside the entity, holding the information. Releasing, transferring, providing access, or divulging information. Managing and storing patient information, privacy rules. Notify patients of privacy rights and privacy procedures that are in place. Training the staff to understand privacy procedures 
designate an individual to oversee privacy procedures and secure patient records to limit access. In other words, if you don't need to know about the patient's financial um, abilities to pay, then you don't have access to that part of the record. Patient notification. Privacy rule requires notice of privacy practices written in plain, simple language. It advises the patient to review carefully, describes use and disclosure of the information, and describes rights under the privacy rule, describes covered entities' duties, and outlines complaint process. States privacy practices can change. Sharing patient information. Core elements include the description of authorized information, per persons authorized to use information, purpose of requested information, and the patient's right to revoke authorization and a signature and a date. The privacy rules allows for TPO. Treatment can share information to provide care. Payment can share information in order to receive payment for treatment. And operations can share information to conduct normal business. The HIPAA security rule specifies how patient information is protected on security networks. All facilities must take action to reduce breach of confidentiality in the reception area, the clinical station, and the location of fax machine machines. Think about it. Chart security. Where are your charts kept? Reception area security. Can anyone see your screen or hear the patient talking to you? Patient center security. Is patient protected health information PHI available to anyone? And fax, copier, and printer security. Are measures in place to protect information being sent? Violations and penalties. All staff are responsible for adhering to the HIPAA rule. Any breaches can lead to substantial penalties or incarceration. Violations can incur civil and criminal penalties. Administrative simplification. Standardized patient information with a set of transaction standards and code sets. Codes and formats used for exchange of data are referred to as electronic transaction records. And examples of these are the ICD-10 CM codes, these are diagnostic codes that are used on the patient's record. These codes answer the question, why are you here or what is wrong with you? CPT-4 codes are procedure codes. Once you are at the doctor's office, these two questions are answered for CPT codes. Where did you go for your care and what did you have done? And HGPCS codes, HCPCS codes, which are used for supplies and information for Medicare patients. Confidentiality issues and mandatory disclosures. There are six principles. Number one, when in doubt, it is better not to release information. Number two, the patient's right, not physicians, to keep information confidential. Number three, all patients should be treated with the same amount of confidentiality, confidentiality regardless of situation. Number four, be aware of applicable laws and regulations. Number five, with conflict between ethics and confidentiality, discuss release with the patient. Number six, written approval needed before release of information. And if you've ever asked for your medical record, you know you have to show in person, you have to go to the medical records department or the office in the front and show your license and sign a medical records release form before records are released. Ethics. Ethics deals with the general principles of right and wrong, and bioethics are social issues. So bioethics deals with issues that arise related to medical advances. Examples, use of fetal tissue, surrogate mothers, or organ donation allocation. Legal medical practice models. There are five basic types of medical practice. Please memorize these. A sole proprietorship is one in which there is one physician in the practice. A partnership has two physicians. A group practice is three or more physicians. And professional corporation where physicians are employees, such as the physicians who work in the clinics for Yale New Haven Healthcare. And clinics. And that ends our lectures on law and ethics.